Welcome, wise women. Here we are at Temple of Israel, a place you all remember. We are about to begin with our speaker, our very first speaker, Deborah. James Naughton. One of the tenets of wise women is to always be informed. And today, he will inform you on very, not only pertinent information, important information, and information you may want to act on. So, without further ado, let me introduce our beloved James Naughton. I can just imagine everyone applauding in their little living rooms. Thank you all. It's nice to be back. I'm told that I was here two years ago. Yeah. So I'm in danger of repeating myself, I suppose. But I'll try not to do that. In thinking about what I might say to you this morning, uh, it occurred to me imagining where I would be and how I'd be addressing you um, that I am, uh, and it's true, uh, I, I miss being with um, all of you in a room together. Someone asked me the other day, a friend of mine who's an actor said, do you miss performing? And I said, that's a really interesting question. I'm going to have to think about that. Um, because I have been doing some performances along the way. Um, this next week I'm going to be performing with my kids, my children, in, uh, in the Westport Country Playhouse Gala, which I think is going to be a, a, a video down at the Remarkable Drive down off Imperial. We recorded a couple of songs to be part of that show. And um, every day for the last um, several months, pretty much almost every day, I have been recording uh, radio and television spots for the Democratic Party leading up to the election. I did one this morning, as a matter of fact, uh, just about an hour ago from home. Um, and for Joe Biden, by the way. And uh, so I have been doing some kind of performing. It certainly isn't the same thing as working as I have uh, for most of my career in, in the theater. And so I thought I'd, I'd talk a little bit about what that is that I'm missing and why. Uh, I, um, I uh, used to spend a lot of summers working at the Williamstown Theater Festival up in Massachusetts. And there was a fellow there, an irascible guy, who was a friend of mine, uh, just a, a civilian, he wasn't an actor. His name was Phil. And uh, he used to fall asleep during every performance that we ever gave. And he would say to me after the show, he said, gee, Jim, you know, that, that show was really pretty good. I only slept a little bit there now. So Phil said something that, that's always stayed with me. And uh, I, think, I think it speaks to what it is that we enjoy, those of us who do enjoy it, going to the theater, being in a room in a big hall with uh, a couple of hundred other people and, and enjoying some kind of a, a drama or a comedy or a musical. Phil said, you know, he said, I, I, I spend a lot of money and I come to every show. I buy the sub subscription to the Playhouse, to uh, the Williamstown Theater Festival. And there are a lot of shows going on in various theaters, out on the lawn and everything else, in cabarets at night. He said, and I buy the whole package because, well, I know I sleep through some of the shows. He said, but Every once in a while, and every summer, something goes on in that theater that I wouldn't want to miss because it's something that's very special and only happens like that. And I thought that's about as good an explanation of why you go to the theater as I've ever heard. So my irascible old um, friend, who's no longer with us, um, with whom I didn't have any agreement about almost anything, certainly nothing political. Uh, he did say something that has stayed with me, which I've got uh, ever since then. But I want to talk about what it is that we do, those of us who, make, who practice uh, a life in the theater. And um, I like to think that the primary function of art, of which theater is a, a, a part, is to illuminate for us something about what it is to be human. To try
transport us, to, to inspire us, to appeal to our better instincts. If it sounds to you like I'm, we're all possibly on an elevator and, and the bells are ringing, it sounds like that to me here too. To transport us, to inspire us, to, to appeal to our better instincts. And having spent my life working in the theater as an actor and as a director, I've had the good fortune to be able to experience moments like this with very large groups of people. And something magical happens when people are moving. A few years ago, I directed the Playhouse's production of the film Browning's Power Time with Paul Now that play certainly holds up a mirror to us, to illuminate for us the human condition. It tells the story of a young girl and a young boy, Emily and George, who grow up together, court, and get married. And then Emily dies in childbirth and is granted the fantastical and universal wish to be able to go back and see her family for just one day. She chooses a day when she was 12, but when she sees her parents, she can't bear it. They're so young and so beautiful, she says. Why do they ever have to get old? Ultimately, she decides that she can't go on. It goes so fast, she says. We don't have time to look at one another. Yes, says Simon Stimson, surely the voice of Thumb and Wilder. Now you know, that's what it was to be alive. To move about in a cloud of ignorance, to go up and down, trampling on the feelings of those about you to spend and waste time as though you had a million years, to be always at the mercy of one self-centered passion for another. That's the happy existence you wanted to go back to, ignorance and blindness. Emily asks the stage manager when she comes back. She says, do any human beings ever realize life while they live every day? No, he says, saints, Poets, they do so. I think that says an awful lot about what it is to be alive, and it says to me an awful lot about what it is to practice a life in the theater. Edwin Booth said that an actor is like a stonemason or a sculptor who works with snow. And so I've always been aware that uh, what we do, what, what we make, is really, there's no there there, except when we are doing it. And um, I think I have to say that I've spent a lot of my time in the last few years working on other projects, things that maybe will produce some kind of a, an event or a product. Uh, we go out there alone in the dark on the stage eight times a week, twice a week, Wednesdays, Saturdays. And um, things can happen to you out there. And I thought I'd share with you a story or two about what happens when things go around. And uh, one of them is a favorite story of mine that happened to a friend, a wonderful Irish man, actor, named uh, Joseph Mahar, or Joseph Mahar, as they called him over there. This is a true story. Joe was playing one of the conspirators in the production of Julius Caesar, and the conspirators had just slain Caesar. Regicide had just been committed. There he was, Julius Caesar, on the deck, having just been slain with the conspirators were all standing around with their bloody daggers. And before anything could be said after the deed had taken place, excuse me, I think I was telling you that a, a dear friend of mine, Joseph Mahar, Joe Mahar, probably pronounce his name, was playing one of the conspirators in the production of Julius Caesar, and they had just slain Caesar. There he was lying on the floor. Nothing had been said. No one had moved since the deed had been done. And all of a sudden, before anybody could say anything and the play could continue, the phone 
began to rip in the wings. It went. The stage manager was supposed to have taken the phone off the hook before the production started. Ring! It went a second time. No one spoke. The conspirators looked at each other out of the corners of their eyes. Ring! It went a third time. The whole audience was spellbound, listening as, as one to the phone ring in ancient Rome. At which point, finally, Joe Mahar broke the silence. He said, What if it's for Caesar? And all the conspirators had to turn upstage. And there was a lot of that going on. These are the kinds of things that can happen when you're on the stage and doing live theater. It brings to mind another wonderful story. This also is a true story. Uh, the Shakespeare play, uh, the first the first line of which is twelfth line, it was. And the first line, the curtain goes up, and the line is a famous one, we all know it. If music be the food of love, play on. And on Saturday matinee, the curtain went up, and the poor actor heard himself say, If food, there were Laughter from the wings spreading to the house. And finally the entire theater was engulfed in, in the falls. And they had to ring the curtain down and wait five minutes for the audience and everyone in the play to, to compose itself. And then the curtain went up again. The poor guy didn't go out there and say, if music be the food of love, play on. You got a standing ovation. And that was just the first couplet in the show. So these kinds of things can happen when you're out there in the dark. Thank you. So what have I been doing besides thinking about being in the theater for a lifetime? What other actions have I been up to these last uh, couple of years? It's been a few years since we did our time. Broadway and TV. I've been working on things that have piqued my interest. Um, you may know I lost my wife. Uh, yes. My wife for 46 years, seven years ago, after a four-year battle with pancreatic cancer. I uh, took care of her for those four years. And, uh, one of the things I learned is that when you have that kind of a challenge, up against something like that. You do whatever it takes to continue to go forward. Uh, there was a time after about two and a half years of chemo that uh, her, her oncologist, a wonderful doctor in New York, and some of you may know Dr. Richard Frank, said to us, well, we've run out of things to throw at her. Uh, there, was, there were no other chemos available that she had to try. He said to me, uh, there's a new clinical trial going on down in San Antonio, Texas. And uh, here's the telephone number, give me a call, and you can get into it. So we called, and we sent all of the paperwork and test results and everything. They wanted to see them. So Pam and I got on a plane, and we flew to San Antonio, Texas, on August day. We got off the plane, it was 114 degrees and blowing. But she qualified and she got the last place in this clinical trial, trial for a new drug trial, treatment, new, new chemo. And so for the next eight months, uh, every Tuesday we got on the one, one way uh, flight, on a stop to the San Antonio from JFK. She was treated on Wednesday and we were on the 7.30 plane home, the only other non-stop operation on Thursday. And we did that for eight months. Well, uh, she lasted another year and a half. But finally, as she said to me the day before she died, well, we always knew that this was a fatal disease. She had to remind me that it was my job at that basically to just keep going forward. And so she died seven years ago. Uh, 
a little over three years ago, Dr. Frank, with whom I had stayed in touch, uh, called me up and said he had a new clinical trial that he wanted to start. And would I and the kids help him raise the funds to get it off the ground? And so we did. And, and the Norton family singers were born. My son Greg and daughter Kayla, daughter in law Kelly, and in law Kelly, and I uh, put together a show. And we did it at the Clubhouse concert uh, with a band led by none other than Chris Cooper, of course. And uh, we raised and gave to Dr. Frank after that night uh, $1.3 million to get that trial off the ground. It's up and running. And uh, what it is, it's a trial to try to find an early diagnosis for pancreatic cancer. As many of you may know, I'm sorry if you do, because it's nice to be able to things like that. What, what, hap what happens when pancreatic cancer? Uh, it's said to be the number two cancer killer in the next couple of years because it does not present until it's already in stage four. And you don't know it's there, it's a sign of the killer. Um, Dr. Frank wanted to try to find a new diagnosis for that, and that would be a game changer for everyone, uh, if that were possible. And the way in which he goes about it is he wants to try to find, he knows that there is a, a correlation, a slight correlation, between uh, people with, over the age of 50 with new onset diabetes and cancer. It's not a one percent correlation. But the idea is to try to find a thousand people like that. Either because they have a, uh, an increased hereditary risk of pancreatic cancer for parents or relatives who have it, or people with new onset diabetes. And what we do with the test is um, test their blood, give them an MRI once every year for three years, once every six months for three years. And the hope would be down the road somewhere we can find blood, which would be the first steps. So that's something that I've been involved with. Cigar is up at Seasbury Connected as the honorary chair and speaker and introducer of Dr. Frank and singer of public songs for the entertainment of the people there for Ron Foley Foundation. Probably the Ron Foley had been to that case. He was Guido, Barbara, Startup Foundation. And they raised a lot of money for cancer research, and particularly for pancreatic cancer research. And it was Dr. Frank who introduced me. So that's something I've been involved with. Uh, for better or for worse, for about the last seven or nine years, and it's like a true 11, 11 years ago. That's a good, that's a good game changer. I like change. Okay. Uh, what else did I do? Well, I uh, got involved with an issue called Right to Die with Dignity and spent quite a bit of time, a year and a half ago, lobbying the Public uh, Health Committee, which our own West Coast, uh, own Jonathan Steinberg, who is the chair of it, to uh, try to pass this legislation. Um, it's been passed in about 10 states in the District of Columbia goes back to 1997 when it was passed in order. And the objective is to let people who are suffering at the end of their life um, with medical help at the end of their lives. Uh, I can't believe it's only been in the United States that it seems to me it's a no thing. So I went up and testified before that committee in order to have it show up on it. Or the legislation is what is required is for it to be passed by the public health committee. And we failed last year by one vote to get that pass, which was kind of heartbreaking. Uh, I say heartbreaking because another person who was testifying on behalf of this legislation was a woman who lived in the town for a bit named Sharon, who had spent her life, her career, as a hospice nurse taking care of people at the end of life. And she also testified that day and begged them to 
please, please pass this legislation. Because she had stage one numbers. But she knew what was coming for her. She knew what she would need to want her to be able to get the others to serve the Well, it failed. And recently I inquired about she asked, how is she? I was told, incredibly, that um, she had just put her house on the market and was going to move to New Jersey because New Jersey had enacted this legislation here. And she was going to, at a time when one would think staying at home, being taken care of by her neighbors and friends, and in her own would be an important part of her life. This wasn't happening, so she was going to move at this time to a new place so that she could avail herself of her okay. relative that afternoon. I lost a dear friend last December, and I had to be in the evening. And uh, when they were she came out of a show called City of Angels. Okay, 
And he said, he said, when do you want to do it? I said, well, this Saturday. It was Wednesday. He said, well, you don't have enough time to do it, do you? I said, we're going away. We're going to Ireland for a week, next week. So we got to do it right away. Can't wait two weeks. He said, okay, I'll call the chief of police in our first selectman. And I said, I'll call Blumenthal and I'll talk to, uh, and, and I'll call uh, Dan Wu and see if we can get this thing on 06 Well, three hours later, I talked to Senator Blumenthal. He was in, all in. He show up and speak. Uh, I got a lady who had been there, uh, who'd been down there, also from the Save the Children, which used to be the most important now. She would come to speak. Um, Dan Wu uh, wrote that we were going to be down there marching and speaking. I called my friend Chris Coogan and borrowed his uh, PA system and set up my son Greg and I set it up on Jesse Green. And then three or four, and the chief of police said yes, and the first lieutenant said yes, and we were off and running. So there we were at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning. Signs and full horn, and I've been walking back and forth on the bridge. Um, I haven't made a sign in March since maybe the Vietnam War, or maybe even high school. But there we were. Um, my daughter in law was off to do uh, two shows that day on Broadway, Tristan Kate. And she showed up at 10 o'clock. And I said, When do you have to leave? She said, I have to be in the 11 o'clock train in New York. So, uh, We'll start the thing at 10.30, will you see? Would you see the national anthem at the start of She said, okay. Uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning, I looked down the bridge and coming from 33 to the other side. Walking toward us at 10 a.m., right on the dot, was Senator Blumenthal. He marched with us, he came, he spoke. Ken Bernard spoke. I spoke and introduced everybody and said what, what it was we were doing there. What we were doing there was we were trying to protest the incarceration of children in cages and the separation of children from their families in the name of the United States of America, which I still can't believe is happening, but it is. So that's something else that took a little bit of my time uh, last year. Um, this year in June, maybe because of that event, I was asked to, uh, to speak to the folks on June Day, which is a day that, where Westport has for many years entertained uh, and ha held symposia, et cetera, uh, for people who work at the UN. And um, so I, I said, well, what do you want me to speak about? And I was, they said, what would you like? I mean, would you like to, we'd like you to speak about, about to the people who work at the UN. And I said, well, how about if I talk to them just about why I think the UN is important and um, as, a, as a citizen, as a father, as a grandfather? And they said, okay. So, so I sat down finally and I, I wrote a piece and they shot it and it, this was last June, so it was being done virtually, as is this. And I, I, there's one paragraph in it that I thought I'd like to share with you. Uh, it goes on a bit, where I talk about all the things that the UN has meant to the world since 1945. UN was founded uh, in response to two world wars and to try to prevent a third. And it's done that pretty well, or at least it's been helpful. Um, there are an awful lot of people and a huge contingent who find the UN uh, objectionable. I'm not one of those. And so I said, after talking about all the things that I had, that I thought were, had been helpful that the UN had done in my lifetime, uh, I said, you know, and if it, there were ever a time, this is last June, for alliances to be strengthened, it's now. And yet in my own country, just when they are needed most, something terribly wrong is occurring. The U.S., in the face of an existential threat, has pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord. 
turning its back on containing nuclear proliferation, it's withdrawn from the Iran nuclear deal. And because it didn't like being told that too many Americans live in poverty, the, human, the UN Human Rights Council, but also UNESCO and the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, the Arms Trade Treaty, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and now it's threatening the World Trade Organization and the World Health Organization. I haven't mentioned that all of this running away from the world and our responsibilities to mankind is prelude to where we find ourselves now. With a global pandemic and the ensuing recession, the size and duration of which is unknown. So, those are a few of the things that I've been up to in these last couple of years. And in thinking about coming to speak to you today, I think about, and at this time of my life, and uh, I, think, I think about some of the formative moments, the experiences that I've had that have led me th to be who I am and think the way I do and uh, have been involved in some of these issues. Um, and I think, for example, of a man and a conversation I had in 1964 or five I was in college, and um, my roommate was a hockey player. We lived, we had an apartment off campus in Providence, Rhode Island. I went to Brown University, and, and so the, the pub down at the end of our street uh, was a bar called Manny Almeida's Ringside Lounge, where you meet the leading sports figures of the world. That was the title of the bar. It was down in Fox Point. Um, and many of the old U New England universities were built in what are now the oldest parts of town. In 1964 and 5, that particular part of town, Fox Point, was uh, inhabited by a lot of folks who were poor, many of whom were out of work. Um, and they became people that I met uh, in uh, Manny Almeida's Ringside Lounge, where you meet the leading sports figures of the world. I remember having a conversation with a guy who, named Mingo, who was one of those fellows. And he had a little boy named Stevie, who was maybe four or five years old. My roommate, the hockey player, and I used to take Stevie up to the hockey rink so that he could, he could learn to ice skate. And I remember having a conversation with Mingo, who was not feeling hopeful for himself uh, and I remember trying to buck him up giving him some sort of an encouragement about what was happening politically and how the the Civil Rights Act had been passed and the voter Voting Rights Act was about to be passed and Mingo listened to me <laughs> patiently and then he looked at me and he said Jimmy he said you know my my little boy Stevie and I said, yeah, sure, of course, Mingo. We, we, take him, we take him skating. Why? And he said, well, he said, I appreciate all the stuff that you're saying, but it's not going to happen in time for Stevie, is it? And I said, no, no, you're right. I'm sorry. I apologize. I'll never forget that conversation. And it brought home to me that these issues that we like to talk about or read about or fight about uh, actually have a hu human cost. And I learned that lesson that day a long time ago. So uh, I take these kinds of uh, conversations um, not with a grain of salt. Another issue, that issue is particularly timely. Here we are 60 years later, and uh, we haven't come very far. Another issue that is in the news these days, I have a little bit of a personal experience with, because my wife's, uh, my to-be wife's uh, roommate in college uh, got pregnant and wanted to have an abortion. And so Pam and I 
went with her down to New York City on a Saturday afternoon. We dropped her off at a corner on 7th Avenue and 57th Street. And she was picked up, and I think she was taken across the river to New Jersey, where an abortion was going to be performed. And Pam and I sat in a restaurant on the corner for four or five hours, just white-knuckling it, worrying about her roommate and what would become and where she, how she would be when she came back. I'll never forget that afternoon, and I hope that we never have to see that again. Um, that's informed how I feel about that issue. Nikki was okay, uh, but it was uh, a really tough few days. Um, <laughs> it seems to me at this point, I probably ought to tell you another funny theater story. But maybe instead what I could do is ask you if uh, there might be some questions that I could address. Well, was there, wasn't there a question that came up before I started? Yes, but you answered it. Oh, I already answered that. The one question that's come in? Yes. Well, I'm in trouble. Oh. I could tell you about um, what happens when you're out on the stage and uh, you've forgotten your lines or you don't have anything else to say, as I may be in, in that situation right now. Uh, it's happened to me. It happened to uh, Sir John Gilgood and Sir Ralph Richardson rather famously um, in a production of, of Home on the West End. Both of the gentlemen were uh, well advanced in years and um, everyone in the audience was thrilled to be there, to be witnessing these two lions of the theater when they realized that nothing had been said for quite a long time. And they waited and they waited and they waited and still nothing had been said. And so eventually they heard a line come out from the wings, and still nothing from either gentleman. It came out again a second time, louder, still nothing. Finally, the third time, it came out so loudly that everybody in the last row of the orchestra could make out each word. And finally, Sir John Gilgood stood up and he said, we know the line, who says it? Which I've always thought was kind of amusing. Um, I was out on stage with Lenny Baker uh, in a show in 1977 and 8 at the Barrymore Theater called I Love My Wife. And we'd been on the stage together for about nine months. It was a Saturday matinee. And all of a sudden, in the first act, uh, neither one of us was saying anything. And we were looking at each other, hoping that the other one might be able to remember where we were supposed to be and nothing was forthcoming. We were saying things to each other like we were Wally and Alvin. Well, gee, Alvin. Uh, and he would say, yes, Wally. Uh, what do you think? And I'd go, I don't know, Alvin. What do you think? And he's, I asked you first. I mean, we were, we were dying out there. And uh, finally, all of a sudden, it, it, it occurred to me that I had been told I'd had dinner a couple of weeks before with Milo O'Shea, wonderful Irish actor who was in a production of The uh, Touch of the Poet with Jason Robards and Geraldine Fitzgerald. And Geraldine had played my mother in my first play in New York, which was Long Day's Journey Into Night, directed by Long Wharf's own uh, Arvin Brown, starring Robert Ryan, Geraldine Fitzgerald, Stacey Keach, and me. And so we had had dinner together, uh, Jason and Geraldine and Milo. And Milo told me that he had once seen an act actor in a verse play when he went up, lost the line, that's what we call it, he went up, say without dropping a beat, the words have from my memory jumped. I think I'll go and get a prompt. Which I thought was pretty ingenious. 
Now, this was not a verse play. We were in a, a, an American musical written by Cy Coleman and Michael Stewart. But we were desperate. And, and what does an actor do when he's desperate? And neither he nor his acting partner <laughs> knows what day it is or what we're supposed to be doing out here. So I said, the words have from my memory jumped. I think I'll go and get a prompt. And I did a little Jackie Gleason and off I went into the wings where my understudy and the stage manager and everybody else in the crew had amassed to watch the disaster that was unfolding out there on the stage. And they all told me my line. I went, yeah, 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 okay. And I turned and I didn't want to leave Lenny out there by himself. So I raced back out there. Lenny was standing in the middle of the stage, actually going like this doing his best Stan Laurel imitation. And I raced out on the stage and said, Alvin. And somehow it hadn't gone in. You know, I was just in such a rush to get back out there that whatever it was that they told me the line was, I'd totally forgotten. And so I knew we were in a musical. And if you're in a musical, there ought to be a song coming up here sometime soon. So I yelled, piano, please. And they brought us in. They brought us in with the, with the number. And we were okay after that. Turns out that the one line that neither of us could remember was the cue line for the song. I mean, wouldn't you think that the conductor would have started us in, you know? And we must have been stuck out there for mm, a minute or two, just dying, which is what you do when you're out there with can't remember your lines. Um, and so anyway, I think that that's about all the stories I have for you today. I hope that uh, if you have a question, you can get it in and I'll do the best I can. And if not, I'm going to have to give you back to one of the ladies who runs your organization. We have a question. Are my children, uh, Greg and his wife, Kelly, staying in the Westport area during COVID? Yes, they are. They have kids who are in school here in Westport. Uh, we have an 11-year-old in sixth grade and a seven-year-old in second grade. And uh, we all got tested and went to Maine together at the end of August. We have a place up there in the family on the rocks. And uh, it was wonderful. And then we came back and we hung out together we were all in our little bu family bubble together. And Greg said to me uh, a few weeks ago, he said, Dad, you know, uh, uh, the kids are going to school. They start on Tuesday. So I guess um, you're not going to be, we're not going to be hanging with you the way we have been. And uh, that's been unfortunate. And that's been the case. So I get to see them from afar. And we don't get to spend the kind of time together that we have been and had been uh, throughout the summer. But um, we are performing together in uh, uh, next Saturday. Well, actually, we're not going to be together because we already shot that. That's, that's uh, part of the uh, Westport Gala. But we also did a Norton Family Singers concert in, together in July uh, up at the... Uh, at Stockbridge Musical Theater Group up in, uh, well, the, it was in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. And it, it was a lot of fun because for the two or three weeks before that, we would get together every Sunday on my screen porch and um, rehearse our, put together a show and rehearse all of our parts uh, with Chris Coogan on the, on the uh, keyboard, of course. And I got to tell you, there's nothing that's more fun for me than to be able to sing and perform with, with the family. Um, we were doing songs by James Taylor and uh, I can't remember anything else at the moment, but we, we did a whole evening. Um, you may have seen in the newspaper that Godspell was the first live show performed up in Pittsfield under the tent this summer. In fact, they extended it through September all um, uh, appropriately in, uh, observing protocols, social distancing and masks, et cetera. Uh, but we were the first performance performers in that space, in that tent with the sides rolled up and the audience about 50 feet away from the stage and not very many of them in there. I think there were a total of maybe 100 people under this huge tent that would have normally uh, uh, held maybe 300. But it was wonderful to be uh, able to 
uh, hang and sing together, uh, which was uh, something that once you haven't done it and then you, you get back to it, you realize how much you've missed it. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I should I, I should mention um, that there was a, a, th a question came in or, or a comment mentioning my son's band, which is called The Sweet Remains, and you can Google it, and they're really really good. They sound like Crosby, Stills and Nash, and they write all their own stuff. They've performed here at the Levitt and and in other areas, other places around, uh, well, all over the country really. And Kelly, my daughter-in-law, whom you may know from Kiss Me Kate and, and uh, South Pacific and A Light in the Piazza and everything else on Broadway. Uh, what, did she, what was it that she did that was just remarked on um, with the high school? Oh, yeah, the high school competition, Staples. Yeah, yeah, well, we're involved in the community. And they are too, and it's a, a delight to, to have them be here for me, just strictly for personal reasons. <laughs> Do I think the grandchildren are, uh, have a chance, really? You know, I've always thought that kids basically can only go two ways. They can either follow in your footsteps or they're going the opposite direction. In my case, the kids came but I've always thought, really, that, that the Williamstown Theater Festival had a, an, quite an influence on them because f when they were children in the in the 1980s, um, and we were spending pretty much every summer there, they kind of saw the best of the business. I mean, the plays that we did, um, the uh, the people who were working there were sort of who's who in American theater, and um, it, it was a delight. Uh, the kids would be in, in tennis camp uh, in Williamstown, and then they'd come to the show at night, and then we'd all go to the cabaret after that. And this went on for pretty much that whole decade, actually. Quite a delight. Well, I think I should bid you all adieu. I don't know if anybody wants to say anything before we sign off. Well, we want to, of course, thank you. We're so happy to thank you. I really appreciate everything you've done. You're a wonderful person. You're a wonderful person. Thank you. Thanks very much. A gift? Yeah, we'll be taking not too much, of course. We're all observing COVID here, and we're all, let's see, no touching. Okay, all right. A gift. So, thank you very much. Hope to see you all again, or hope to see you, period, someday. <laughs>